So some of the rules of visual design can help take a data visualization and make it more appealing so that people will want to look at it and investigate it more. We don't have time to go into all the rules of visual design, but I can basically summarize a few of the rules that have come from Edward Tufte, who's written several books on the subject. The first one is to let the data speak. It's very easy when we're collecting data and doing our data processing to smooth our data, to try to remove outliers and try to fill in missing data gaps and so on. And sometimes it's best just to display the data and let human reasoning, uh, the re reasoning of our cognitive systems be able to take care of, uh, of those details. For example, here's life expectancy data for two countries, Belize and Bermuda. Belize has data for all the years from 1960 to 2012, and Bermuda is missing a lot of data. It's got a lot of gaps here until the year 2000. And so we could, I could have filled this in with um, you know, plausible data or drawn lines between these, but it's better to just let your inductive system uh, fill these in with uh, what you would expect to, to be between these data points and also to let your abductive reasoning try to figure out why the data wasn't being gathered in these gaps. Uh, another design rule is that a picture is worth a thousand words and so uh, you can often show with a diagram or a picture things that it would take a lot of text to describe. Uh, this is a very old illustration. It's a visualization by Charles Menard in 1869 of Napoleon's army as it's marching towards Moscow. And the width of this line is the size of the army. And it gets to Moscow and it's withered down to a small size compared to what it started with. And then it begins a retreat and the retreat becomes, um, the size of the army becomes even smaller in part because of the falling temperatures which are plotted down here. It may take a lot of text or annotation in order to describe what the uh, army size was, but you can see visually here, uh, based on, on this pictorial, pictorially, what's going on a lot better and in a smaller space. Uh, with that said, um, even though you can say a lot with pictures, uh, you still need to say a lot with words. Uh, most importantly, you. Um, should not forget to label your axes. It's very important to label your axes. And here's a couple diagrams from some of my own publications where we're plotting various data or various behaviors. And you can see there's a lot of attention that needs to go into annotations to not only make sure that the reader understands what's being plotted, but, um, but also understands the semantics behind the graph. What bars at this altitude versus this altitude uh, mean what this line means here versus, the, versus this line here. So annotation uh, words are still important to visualization and it's the, um, it's the rela relationship between the words and the geometry often that gets the job done in a, in a visualization. So you can also add too much information to a visualization and, and Tufty's advice is uh, uh, encapsulated nicely in the term chart junk, which basically says that um, when you try to make a visualization look prettier and add a lot of elements to a visualization, those elements can detract from the actual message that the visualization is trying to provide to the to the observer. Um, very commonly, three dimensions can can make a two dimensional graph look. Uh, more engaging. This three-dimensional graph looks nicer than this two-dimensional graph. But as we've seen with uh, perspective, if I've got a bar that's farther away, if I have a bar in the forefront and a bar in the background, sometimes it can be difficult to see if, if a bar in the background is shorter because it's farther away or is it shorter because it's representing a smaller amount. And so um, it's better to avoid three dimensions and it's better to avoid adding a lot of extraneous details to a chart that may make it look more engaging but could detract from its real message. A nice quantitative measure of chart junk is the data ink ratio. And the data ink ratio basically states that um, how much data are you displaying in your visualization divided by how much ink are you using to in the in the visualization 
And so you want to maximize the data ink ratio, meaning you want to display as much data as possible using as little ink as possible. And so for example, here's a perfectly good bar chart um, displaying some item in units of one, two, three, four, and five, you know, um, unit gaps uh, there. I can display the exact same thing without these horizontal lines without even the annotations here on the left because the annotations are, are changing by counting numbers uh, one two three four and five I can just display them as stacked uh, discrete bar segments and I can see the same information that uh, this is basically some value a little more than four this is some value even um, a, a bit larger than two I can see the same information here. I've used less ink, and um, I can focus more on the actual data. This is an example where Ed Tufte is, is reveals that he's really a minimalist. Uh, he wants as little, inf you know, as, as little decoration as possible in visualizations. There are other people working in visualization who have set up different design aesthetics that have also generated effective visualizations. And so Tufty is not the only um, name in visualization and the only advice you should follow, but these are, these are good uh, recommendations in any case. Um, another principle is, is the micro and the macro of a visualization. So you've got micro level details and macro level details. And, and the best example is again from the NCSA. Here's another visualization of a tornado. And um, you know, on the bottom here, we've got wind being displayed perhaps as little stalks of wheat. And you can see wind direction here in the foreground. And in the background, that becomes more of a texture. And so you've got micro level and macro level details. And we can create zoomable interfaces. Zoomable interfaces allow us to change which details are at the macro level that we can look at and which details are at the micro level that we can get a broad overview of. And uh, this leads to uh, this mantra for doing large data visualization uh, where you want to see a broad overview first and then get the details on demand and be able to zoom into those details and, and be able to switch from a macro view uh, to a micro view. Um, it's also to, to think of information as, as being organized into layers. And this is a visualization project I was, I was part of a few years ago where we were visualizing the structure of, of music um, in a different layout than, than is usual for music. And so we're visualizing, for example, note values here in blue, and we're visualizing similar chord structures in, in black characters, and I'm showing some relationships in light gray of neighboring elements to a, a given relationship organized in heavy black here. And so by using these different design elements, uh, changing the color, changing typeface, uh, italics or bold, you, you can organize the visual display of information a little bit better, give hints to the viewer of the, uh, the different categories. Uh, this is very similar to you know, the display of nominal data using hue, for example, um, or using a, a different typeface or um, a different decoration as a way of dis discriminating between uh, nominal uh, variable. Also multiples, Tufty speaks of multiples, and that is to basically maintain a consistent design and have multiple visualizations um, using that same consistent design so that you can see the differences um, as the data changes. And so uh, in this example from one of my own papers, we have several different uh, graphs, and in each case I've tried to maintain the exact same, the, the same vertical axis, uh, the same annotation for the different uh, cases and in fact the same horizontal as much as possible the same horizontal axis although it changes a little bit so that you can see the difference from graph to graph in, ad in addition to the individual changes in the data variables inside each graph. And visualizations, especially presentation visualization and interactive storytelling, um, tell a story. And so you might think, what story is your 
data visualization actually telling? And the best way to think about this is what's happening over time? What's happening across space? And here's a plot of life expectancy uh, in Rwanda and uh, the neighboring Congo, uh, the Republic of Congo. And you see this huge dip in the life expectancy in Rwanda. This is, this is just tragic. And a lot's going on here. And, you know, these two lines are telling quite a story because they're describing two neighboring com countries and very different circumstances in the two countries. And finally, color. Your choice of color can be important if it's used properly, but color chosen arbitrarily can be quite harmful. And um, in this example, you know, rainbow is not the best. And um, as, as we'll see next, uh, the choice of color can be very important. And there's, there's additional design decisions to be made based on the choice of color. Here we're looking at a three-dimensional object, and we're using a rainbow map that has bright and dark spots in it. And those bright and dark spots can interfere with our perception of the three-dimensional shape. And also the shading of the three-dimensional shape can interfere with our perception of the variable that's being mapped to color. So these rules came from Tufty's books, and Tufty tends to be a minimalist. Uh, he tends to want to use the least um, amount of uh, presentation possible in a visualization. And that's one design criterion, but it's only one of many design criterions. And I encourage you to look at other uh, visualizations from other designers and to maybe explore your own sense of uh, design style.